Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kaya Carrington Russell, Australian best selling author known for my kick ass heroines, action packed fantasy with a bit of steamy romance. And I have a very exciting interview for today. We are talking to a very well loved author who is known for her young adult, new adult fantasy romance, and her covers are absolutely stunning. We are talking to the one and only Tasonia Odet. How are you today? I am so good and I'm so excited to be here. I know. I am so excited that you came on too. One, I love a fellow fantasy author. And two, your covers are so beautiful. Like, I just can't get over them. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so take me back to the start then. Why Why did you start writing and how did you find publishing for the first time? Um, so I wrote my very first book in 2002. I was just, I think I just graduated high school and I'd always written, but I had this idea for a fantasy book. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to write it because when you have stars in your eyes, everything seems very easy. And I'm like, I'll just write it. It's going to be great. And then I'll publish it in like, you know, a year or something. And so I wrote this book and I thought it was fantastic. Uh, It, and you know, my, the people who knew me who read it were like, it is like such a great book. Um, And I tried to go the traditional route and was very heartbroken when I got my first rejection letter. And then of course I tried to look at it with new eyes and like, you know what, this could use some revisions. Um, so that started my revision, right. Or, you know, pretty, pretty close to when I'd finished the book, I started trying to revise it. And then I went on to revise it for 15 years (laughs) because I just, I would revise it and I'd work on it and I'd get distracted. I would get a lot of self-doubt. And then by the time I would make progress. I would have learned a lot because I was young and was learning a lot of, you know, the more I read, the more I understood writing and the more I'd be like, wow, I have to change this. This book is terrible. And so I'd go back to the beginning and I would get so overwhelmed and then I would put it away. So I did that for a really, really, really long time. Just that constant cycle of like, maybe I'd make one chapter progress. I would get really nervous about something I had to research and I'd feel, I can't do this. You know, I don't think I have what it takes to be a writer. I'd put it away it would come back into my mind. I'd be like, I have to actually work on this book. Okay. Take it out again, you know, over and over and over. I'm sure a lot of writers can relate because back then I didn't know it was normal. I thought I was completely abnormal and no other writers went through this. Um, so it took me a really long time. And then, you know, 15 years later, which math, I'm not going to do that, but it was a few years from now, (laughs) like three years ago, four years ago. Um, I finally finished that my draft, my second or third or hundredth, whatever it was. I was like, okay, now this is good. I can get a beta reader. Um, I had, by that time I had started learning what it took to publish and I had wanted to self-publish. Um, so I, I had an idea of what I needed to do and I went for it and I published the book. Um, and then did turn out, I still had a lot to learn, but at least I made that first step, which was so important. <laughs> so I have two two things off this one is our story is very similar actually because I was the same thing I graduated high school I was like I'm going to be JK Rowling yeah. so rejected by traditional publishers and was so confused as to why mine was not the best book they'd ever written <laughs> um and same thing what was the moment then for you after having that cycle for 15 years because this is a huge challenge that us writers have is self-doubt it's not good enough I need to keep re-editing and it's really hard to break from that cycle so what was the moment that you decided enough is enough? I need to publish this. Um, it happened when, so I have so many, so many hobbies and I felt like I wasn't making a lot of progress with any of them. Mm-hmm. I would get to a point and I'd realize I didn't want to take it to a professional level. And I just, at heart, I knew I wanted to be professionally a creative in some way. Um, I had music, I had art and I just, I had to ask myself like, if I could only do one thing and never gain any kind of recognition for it or, and never become successful, but just do it because that's what I wanted to do. If I could do one thing and like, let's say never make money at it, which would I choose? And I was like, you know what? That's writing. Like if I could, if I had to choose one of these things to just put all my efforts into, it would be writing these books, at least this one book that I've been working on so long. Um, And it just like, that's when I had to kind of get my priorities straight and try and figure out how I was going to actually put all my efforts into that. So yeah, just getting clear with what I really wanted and what was going to make me feel the most creatively fueled. 
um, was that big moment. And also just recognizing the fact that I had let myself get distracted and I hadn't been previously putting all my efforts into it. So, cause you have a lot of side hobbies and you are very, <laughs> you do ukulele, you do guitar, you do singing, yeah. you create your own maps and character like image. And they're amazing too. I stalked you on Instagram a little bit. But <laughs> how do you find, obviously you focus now on writing, but do you find sometimes if you need to re-spark um, inspiration for writing or you just need to step away from it, that you find those other outlets sort of very helpful in that time to sort of just touch base with those? Is that what you do? I do that now, but back when I made that decision, I had to get really strict with myself and not do any of the other things for a while because I was in playing in bands. I was, um, I was doing art a little, that was a little more casual. I'd kind of already grown out of um, feeling like I was going to pursue art as like um, a profession. It just wasn't really clicking with how or where, what direction, but music was kind of my main battle because I loved writing songs. I loved playing music. I'd been in a few different bands before and it was really, really fun, but I had already learned that I did not want to be a professional musician. I did not want to go on tour. I did not want a life on a road, on the road. Um, so that was the main thing that I had a battle because it had instant gratification. I could think of a song in the morning, record it on my ukulele, on my iPad and have it out shared with my friends by the end of the day. And that was all I ever wanted from it. I didn't want to be, um, I got feeling like I should, like I should, you know, pursue a singer songwriter thing. Um, but I realized that I was focusing on instant gratification of getting somewhere where I wasn't going to go. I didn't really want to go anywhere else with versus writing, which I really like when every time I thought about writing, I wanted to try to go all the way. Um, and so I stopped writing songs. I know that sounds terrible, um, you know, because you should always follow your joy, but I just felt like I needed to focus. I had a full-time job, um, a daughter, there was a lot of stuff going on. I really had only had room for one thing. So I, um, stopped doing that and it was writing was my focus for a very long time. But now, now that I have that, um, I have that, like, I can't think of the word right now because, you know, we're writers, but <laughs> it's gone. The thing that means that I focus, <laughs> I have that now. Um, and so I don't fear getting pulled away from it. And so I know what my, when I'm going to write, when my schedule is. So now, yes, it does feel good to take a break and draw and do art and that, especially since it's like an adjacent to my writing thing when I do character art. Um, sometimes I do macrame. Sometimes I'll pick up a really random crafty thing just to do something artsy with my hands. And yes, now I do need that because I need to be able to um, take a break because the more I'm writing, the more it feels like work. And even though it's wonderful work, um, now I do need hobbies. So it's kind of this thing where I had to take a big break, but now I'm like, now I have to bring it back so I can refill, refill my creative well. And that makes sense because one thing that um, is probably the hardest thing for a lot of writers to learn is discipline. Um, yes, that's just, the word I was looking I know, for. I was like, do, do, I, do I suggest this word? I don't know. It's like, this is how writers help each other. Yeah. <laughs> Let me chime in. Discipline, discipline. Yeah. Um, but And that's amazing and very similar as you're saying now, now that you're writing all the time, you need a little bit of break because obviously we love this, this is our passion, but it does kind of sometimes feel like work as well because we have such high expectations of the product that we're creating and we've crafted a business here so we have deadlines to reach. So sometimes it kind of takes that, the the sparkly eyes out of it, I want to say, it does, yes. all the time. But. <laughs> so... Then tell me about your um, Entangled with Faye series. I find that so interesting. And again, I love those covers so much. <laughs> um, I would love to know about the first book and what made you decide to start doing fairy tale retelling? So the Entangled with Faye series um, is my series of fairy tale retellings. And it's set in the same world as the series I wrote previously, um, which is a Faye world. Um, and 
so going back to that first series, it's going to connect. I promise. Uh, the first book I wrote in that series, I had taken a lot of inspiration from beauty and the beast and pride and prejudice in my mind. That's what it was. It was beauty and the beast meets pride and prejudice, but I was trying to write to market specifically for Faye. And I wasn't really, um, I wasn't really going to go all in when it came to making it a retelling or by calling it, you know, either of those, like, I didn't even want to tell people it was inspired by either of those. Cause I really was trying to focus a little bit more on like fey tropes. Um, but I loved it so much. And I also learned during that, during writing that series, cause it's a trilogy. I just got a yearning to write standalones. There are so many people who are like, don't write standalones. Like it's really hard to write standalones. So I'm like, but they're connected standalones yes. and those work and it's romance. So I was like, I think I can do this. And I think I could do it with fairy tale retellings. And so I kind of, to write Curse of the Wolf King, which is my Beauty and the Beast retelling, I was like, okay, this time I'm going to take all of those like um, things that I wanted to do with that first book that I was like, no, we're not doing Beauty and the Beast. We're just going to inspire, get in some inspiration from it. But this time, like, I'm going to go all in. There's going to be a bookshop at the beginning and they're going to, you know, they're going to follow all the, sp the special tropes. There's going to be a, a library at the palace, of course. Um, so that's kind of why I wanted to do that is I really wanted to follow the nudges that I had during that first series that I was like, no, we can't do that. We're writing to market. We need to actually focus this time. Um, but yeah, I gave that, I went all in. I did, I have connected standalones, their fantasy romance, their fairy tale retellings. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, that was uh, my inspiration for starting that series. Yeah, that's so cool because you absolutely love Faye as well. I read that somewhere yes. your why you are obsessed yeah. with Faye. So what... Like, what is your first memory of the Fae? Like, why are you so drawn to that particular fantasy um, trope? Um, I, that's a hard question. I do remember really falling in love with the idea of Fae um, when I read the book that is probably my favorite, favorite book of all time, which is The Book of Atrix Wolf by Patricia A. McKillop. Um, and she presented Fae in a really, um, I don't know, she just, the, her writing style is so it's hard to explain. It's really like whimsical and kind of hard. To, there's like an airy quality to it. And it's not tropey Faye at all. But I remember there was like the, it was just so like magical the way she explained everything. And there was like the hunter with like the moon in his antlers or something. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read it, but I do read it all the time because it's my favorite book. But yeah, the imagery was just so cool. Um, and then I just, it just really stuck with me just thinking about like the fey queen and just the magic realm of, you know, a magic realm in the forest within the forest that you're already in. It's just, it really stuck in my imagination. And then when fey books started getting popular, um, and when I wanted to write to market and I was like, that's the market I'm going to write to because I love fey and I really want to explore my own world of that and, um, yeah. Wow. So then when in your career did you actually start noticing momentum? When were you able to start pulling away from the full-time job and really focus on writing as your full-time career? Um, it was when I released that first phase series. My very first series that I released, the whole, the one about the, um, that took me 15 years to write the first book, it did not meet the mark. It did not sell well. And I, was I did not really understand why I thought I'd written a really good romance you know reviews were reviews were good but they always had some good criticism and I just couldn't really quite understand it and I felt like I needed to like the book didn't even know what it was and looking back now I know all the, the reasons why it didn't do well I know a lot of the ways that I missed the mark but um back then I just couldn't qu quite pin it down um I thought I was like I knew I did totally write to market. And now I know I for sure did not write to market um, <laughs> for sure. But so that's why I kind of wanted to write to market to kind of understand how to do it right. And to how to hit those things that readers are looking for. Um, and it was such a good exercise for me and it really helped me focus and hone in. And it also got me reading a lot more in my genre, which is so important. That was one of my biggest mistakes with that first series is that I was writing young adult fantasy, but during the, that time that I'd been writing it, I'd read Lord of the Rings. And I also read the Hunger Games and Twilight. Those books combined into that, it's not, it makes it kind of, you know, I'm using my hands here because it makes it kind of disconnected. Um, 
And so I wrote that faith series and I read a lot of books and I started to understand what tropes people loved. I started falling in love with tropes. That's another thing that I did wrong the first time around. So I was like, I'm not going to do any tropes. Lingering gazes, that's stupid. Um, <laughs> I just thought everything was so dumb and cliche and reading more and understanding the market. I really fell in love with the market. And that was so important for me to fall in love with tropes and to really love what other readers were loving, not faking it, not making fun of it, not trying to do the opposite of what everybody loved, but really figuring out how to fall in love with it too. And that series started showing me momentum and it was, it kind of happened, um, coincidentally that I released those first two books around the pandemic and I couldn't go back to work. Um, and then I didn't want to go back to work. And then it, I just, I do feel very lucky that I didn't have to go back to work. <laughs> That's amazing. So I'm really, we're talking a lot about the market. We're talking a lot about tropes. So I'm curious as to what advice you would have for fellow writers who are watching now. How did you start discovering or figuring out what your readers liked, how you could embellish on that? Or did you figure out what tropes you liked first and then you started writing that? How did you figure out the market? I figured out what I liked first. Um, and I did, I didn't do things entirely right, I guess, because, you know, when, when we're writing to market as an indie author, the, a lot of the advice is read only indie books and follow what the indies are doing. Make your covers look indie, make your, you know, follow those tropes. Don't follow the trad market because that's a different market. And a lot of the books, I did love some really good indie ones for sure. But a lot of the ones I love the most were trad books, um, especially like the court of thorns and roses, a lot of books like that. Um, and especially the romance. And that's when I started just really understanding like, oh, this is what keeps me reading the page or turning the pages in a romance. Um, and so I decided to just keep going with what I really liked, even though I knew it was a risk because it was going against some of the advice and I wouldn't always tell people to go against the general advice, but I did. And I do think that it helped me write a book that I loved and a book that I had put a lot of passion into and a book where I was um, putting all my, my favorite tropes into it. And I think that does make a difference is when you're really putting your heart into the book and just making it. It's almost like, almost like a service to yourself. You're like, this is for me, yeah. but there are people out there who love that too. And I think when you're really clear on putting everything that you love into something, it's um, easier to attract the people who love those same things because they're really clear and they're heavy. Well, speaking of reading and books, um, you have a podcast, which is called Reading Queens. So I would love to know a bit more about that. Yeah. So me and um, a big group of my other writing friends, we all got together and we started a podcast um, just over a year ago and it is all about books. So it's, it's us as readers um, talking to other readers about books that we love. And there's like a huge cast of us. So it is revolving. It's different. Usually four different hosts. Um, our main host is Valya Lynn. So she's always there, um, but she brings um, three other of us on to talk about different themes. We, we started off with our first season. We talked about tropes. We would read books that focused on different trope and we would talk about them, what we liked about it, uh, what we thought worked, what made us really excited as readers. Uh, now we're a little more random. We talk a lot about movies and I, especially talk a lot about movies <laughs> and TV shows. I'm like usually the one bringing that. I'm like, I watched this this week and it was so great. And I got to talk about it. It has nothing to do with books, but you know, it's, you love the same things about shows that you love about books. So I feel like it kind of works still. <laughs> So, I mean, considering all of us want books into film and you yeah. know, need to be up to date with what's happening. <laughs> what has been your favorite book to write and why? You can only choose one, baby. <laughs> I choose Curse of the Wolf King just because I did, I don't know. For one, I feel like that one was easier than, than the others. I did still hit every book. Every book I hit a self-doubt and I start to think, what if, and what if this goes wrong? What if everyone hates it? What if this kills my career? Um, but there was something really exciting about it. And I think I was just, I was coming off the momentum of my Faye series. I was still writing in that same world that I love. I was honoring all those instincts that I had from writing fairy tale retellings, Beauty and the Beast. It was like, I was, it was just such a service to myself. It was just like a reward. 
And I, I don't know, it was just such a new experience. It was so different from the other books that I, that I'd written so far. And I've written, you know, more books in that series since then. And I'm always like, I miss how it felt when I was writing Curse of the Wolf King. Um, but then I remind myself, I did still have hard times. Every book has a hard time, but I do think that one was my favorite. <laughs> what do you find your greatest challenges usually writing? Self-doubt for sure. Uh, and comparisonitis. And a lot of times it's comparisonitis with myself. I am super analytical and I like to put everything in boxes and patterns. And if I feel like I'm straying from that pattern, I will get stressed out. So I'm like, okay, X times Y times Z equal this last time. But if I put in an E or a, you know, a unicorn head in this spot, it's going to be totally different and I'm going to fail. So it's really hard for me to get out of my own way sometimes and to get out of my own head. Um, but yeah, a lot of times I will be like, this is different than the last book that I wrote in this one weird way. And that can't possibly mean it's going to be a good thing. Um, but every time I go through these things, I, I'm a big journaler. And so I will journal to myself. I'd be like, Hey, future self, you're feeling like this right now. And this is what happened. And you know what? It ended up being fine. So don't freak out. I still freak out anyways, but my freakouts are a lot calmer and I know they're going to end. You know, I know they're going to end this time. It's so similar to the struggle that I had when I was writing that first book, except for this time, I know it's normal and I know everybody else is going through it as well. Um, and this time I know it's going to end. And sometimes all it takes is I just got to talk to my writer friends. They're going to, you know, help me out, give me perspective and be like, you're fine. Just letting it off my chest is sometimes enough. So, yeah. and that's the thing we really have to normalize as well. And I think this comes with age and a career as well. You know, when you've been around for a couple of years or you've written a couple of books that you understand your process, you understand yes. that you're going to have the same conversation, the same obstacles, every single book, but not to say you desensitize from it, but you, when you're faced with it again, you go, okay, I, I'm okay with these feelings and it happens every time. And look at the last book, look how amazing that did. And you just, you continue on. So, and it's very similar story. A lot of authors do that. So it's so awesome that you have a support network around you. That's like, Hey, you know, you do this every time. Let's, let's carry yes. on now, finish your book. <laughs> it's so helpful. I, I need that. And then, you know, I get to be there for them when it happens to them. And I'm like, Hey, look, it's happening to them. So, you know, I'm normal. <laughs> Let's talk about covers because I love your covers. And it's interesting that before you were talking about traditional books that um, you appeal to a lot of them, because when I look at your cover, I actually think traditional cover, which is very interesting. So I'm curious as to where you find your inspiration for them and what advice you have for fellow writers about being specific on what kind of cover they want for their book. So the covers for my Entangled with Faye series, which are my best love covers, I will admit I do them myself and it was not on purpose. Um, <laughs> I had other covers that looked more like my first my first face series that had a girl on the cover. There was a wolf. That was my Beauty and the Beast one. It was very indie. It was very indie focused. And I was like, that's the right thing to do. I've already broken a bunch of rules. I should at least have my my covers be to market. Um, but then I was doing my artsy thing, which by then I had started incorporating a lot of art into my writing. And so I was doing some character art and I was like, I saw, okay. So I started seeing that style in trad covers where they're that flat bot botanical style. And I was like, you know what? I think I can do that. I really like it. I'm, I'll be the first to admit, I am not a super, super amazing digital artist. I do not do realism. I know what my limits are and I know where I'm still growing, but I'm like flat botanical. I can do that. And I think I have, I have this idea for a cover that I could do. Um, I'm like, I probably won't actually use it though, because everybody knows indies can't do their own covers. You know, that's what we're told. A lot of us are like, try not to do your own covers. Hire somebody. It's the best thing to do. And I really took that to heart. And I was so afraid actually to do my own covers. And I had to get over a lot of that fear um, just to show it because by the time I'd finished, I was like, you know what? I think this looks good. It's definitely not the right cover that I should use, but I'm going to use it as a special edition hardcover. And so I revealed it to my readers and they loved it. And I was so surprised, like I honestly got overwhelmed and I had to take a step back because I started getting hit with so much doubt because I felt 
I had major imposter syndrome. I was like, I was just making that for, you know, for me mostly just to play with art and to start incorporating art with my, um, with my writing. And I actually had to go through this whole healing session of being like, it's okay to be seen. It's okay to put yourself out there. And it's okay to be an artist, especially since I, I had pushed art back and been like, you know, that's not my thing. I'm just going to do writing. I had to go through a lot of like emotional healing. It was so weird how one little thing triggered so much, but it was like amazing for my career. Um, I ended up using that as my cover across the board. I'm like, okay, well now I have to do all the covers um, for this whole series, which I have done. And I've gained the confidence, not enough to do anyone else's covers. I have been asked. I'm like, nope, I'm doing my own. <laughs> I have one style and it is these covers and that's all I'm going to do. Um, so yeah, that's the story for the Entangled with Bay covers. They totally happened by accident. I would have had totally different covers, which are gorgeous, by the way. I'm so sad that I like had this designer make me beautiful covers and I end up going a different route. But I also think it super, super helped me figure out who my audience is because um, I do think that I tend to write more trad tropes and a trad style and my covers now match that. And my books do really well on Bookstagram and with readers who also like to buy trad books. So it's, it was so unintentional, but it really helped me. It was the craziest thing. It's like one of those things where I'm like, man, that was magical. Like I didn't try to make that happen, but it did. And I really think it like totally helped my career in just unexpected way. <laughs> I can't even, I'm so jealous right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing because those book covers are so phenomenal. And I'm not by any means doubting your skill set. I'm just so surprised because I can imagine the barrier you went through because we are told don't do your own covers. Yes. Because we're so close to it. And we usually think we're like, yay, look how good it is I did this. And I could imagine being that she's going, what, you like it? Like you're not meant to like it. What's happening? So Yes, exactly. That's amazing that that worked out for you so well. So would that then be perhaps a suggestion for other writers to not necessarily do your own cover? Obviously, you have a skill set for it because you are a former artist or still <laughs> artist, should we say, <laughs> but that you should see what else is happening. As you said, you saw all of those kind of covers and designs, so you decided to go down that route and give it a go instead. Yeah, and I think that it's definitely worth trying things. And it's funny because now I think that that style of covers are um, they're really – Indies are doing them so much more. Indies are doing a lot more type typography covers and it's a risk. There are a lot of risks, but sometimes those risks do pay off and just keeping an open mind, I think is really important and to not, you know, cause I love to analyze and I love the rules and that whole, if I did it this way last time, I should do it that way again. Um, I think it really helps to understand that there could be a risk and that it could not work out, but also keeping an open mind and looking at where things are and not being afraid to keep looking for your lane before you stay in it. And I do think that this series has helped me figure out what my lane is so that I know where to go going forward. Um, I will say I'm not going to design all my covers. <laughs> my next series coming out, I'm like, sorry, guys, I know you love these covers, but I'm not designing them. I'm going to design this series and maybe a different series, but not this one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely worth keeping an open mind and looking at different angles and trying, trying new things. Um, but I mean, if you have something that totally works, it's also okay to stick with that forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely love that story so much. Um, <laughs> so what would you say then your three must-dos are? Every time you have a book release, what are the three must thing or the three must-dos you do to make sure it's as best as the release can possibly be? Um, so the top three things I always do, I'm super, super visual, obviously with the art thing. So I do a lot of reveals. I'll do, um, I, I'll do a cover reveal, uh, with this art in, or with this series in, or my most recent series in particular, and probably most of mine going forward, I do a character art reveal because now my readers expect me to do character art. Um, and I love doing it. So I'm happy to do that. So I'll do character art reveal. I'll do a lot of these little visual reveals, um, leading up to the release. I'll do like the hardcover reveal. Cause my hardcovers usually end up being pretty. I, I have, um, I usually do the character art on the naked hardcover and then the, um, the, uh, the regular design as the jacket. And so I do a lot of like those visual reveals. I also do a lot on 
Um, I do them also on Instagram because I love Instagram. That's like my favorite social media platform. So those little reveals leading up to it, also quotes and stuff, just giving people a taste. I used to not do that. I used to wait until closer to release. But now, as soon as I have started working on it, I try to reveal those things and get people excited um, in the months leading up to that. Um, and then I also, uh, number two, I do my arc team. So I have a launch team and I always do the arcs and I get the books out and I get buzz going. My, my launch team loves re, uh, leaving reviews. They love sharing their enjoyment of the book. And then number three, which is something that I only started doing with the Integral with, with Faye series is bookstagram tours. Cause again, I love Instagram. And I have really loved doing bookstagram tours. I love seeing my books with people taking pretty pictures of them. So um, yeah, it all <laughs> kind of revolves to around my joy for a specific platform. But I think that's really helpful is if you have like a platform or a place or somewhere that you really like to be, um, putting your efforts there is um, really helpful, I feel like. Yeah, what are some of the... Like, because I love Instagram too. I love um, when people are posting all your books and that because some of the pictures are so magical and you can use them as well. You can reuse yeah. them with permission, of course, but you can reuse them as well. It's a win-win really. And some of the stuff they do is phenomenal. Like I just yes. think like, I could never possibly do that. Like they just put a lavender leaf on top. I'm like, wow, it's so pretty. <laughs> but <laughs> what, um, what web, uh, websites do you use or is there any particular um sort of PR company that you continue going back to is there anyone you would recommend so specifically for bookstagram tours I love using book of matches media um, mm -hmm. I also want to do uh, a tour with storygram eventually because their pictures are also really gorgeous but I've done three with book of matches media so far and they were phenomenal there's it's such a great company to work with and the photos are amazing the bookstagrammers are super sweet and super talented with their pictures um, but yeah, that's, so, that's pretty much all I've used when it comes to like, a, an outside company, but I'm like, I'm so glad I did because at first I was like, I'm just going to do this myself. I'm going to find, like reach out to people. I'm like, you know, what's so cool. Letting somebody else do that and giving them money. <laughs> because time is precious when you're yes. <laughs> What? Take oh. my money. <laughs> Thank you for all your hard work. Love you. I'll see it in six months. No, I'm kidding. Uh, what? So then Let's talk audiobooks because you also have audiobooks, which is awesome. So how did you find that process? So I I have audiobooks for um, my very, very, very first series. My process was a little different. For that one, I had no budget. Um, so I did royalty share. I found a narrator who was really early in her career. So she would agree with me on royalty share. And, you know, they turned out really great. Um, unfortunately that series didn't sell very well. So the audiobooks don't sell very well either. So I definitely learned something from that. Um, and then, so I decided that I wasn't going to do audiobooks again until I could, um, pay for them up front because I felt like it was a little unfair for me to have someone do royalty share for a series that wasn't selling. Like, it'd be better if I just pay them for their work. Um, and so I decided to wait until I reached a certain income level before I started investing in audiobooks. And so I did reach that, that income level. And then I, um, decided to reach out to a narrator who I really loved because my favorite audiobook from the year that I started doing audio was Shadows Between Us by Trisha Lebenseller and her narrator was Caitlin Davies. And so I reached out to her specifically. I'm like, I don't know if she's going to say yes, but I would like, I can hear my character in her voice. Um, and she said, yes. And so I, um, I felt very, very grateful because I was so excited to have them in, you know, with a character that I was so excited to work with. Um, and it worked really great. She's super professional. And I, I even learned a lot from her about how, you know, the best, um, cause she asked for like pronunciation guides. I'm like, that's so brilliant. I'll record MP3 of the pronunciation guide. Um, but yeah, the process has been like really, really easy. I also have my previous face series um, was signed with Tantor, but I also have the same narrator for that. So it's really cool because all the books set in the same world now have the same narrator. So um, it's pretty cool. So I, 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 that was a big goal of mine was to experience what it is like to produce my own audiobooks or to pay for my own audiobooks versus having them with a publisher. And that has only happened since last year. So I don't have like a, I don't have my analysis quite yet, but so far I love it. I love audiobooks. I, I 
do you think I can safely say that if the audio or if the books are selling well in ebook, print or whatever, audiobook will sell well too. And if they're not, it's a gamble. <laughs> what then would your advice be for writers who want to write like romantic fantasy for the first time? Do you have any top tips? Yeah, so it definitely goes back to what I said about falling in love with tropes because that first series I wrote about, I go back to that first series all the time because it is was such a such a lesson for me. But I thought that I wrote a romance. I thought it was so romantic, but I was like, I'm not gonna have them do like, you know, shudder at the when they touched hands. I'm not gonna have that. I'm not gonna have them look at each other across the fire. I'm not gonna have them lick his bottom lip because who does that? Um, but then when I started reading more romance books and I started falling in love with certain tropes and like even things that were like like who licks their bottom lip but when a guy does it in a book you're like oh yeah (laughs) it's it might be kind of silly but it does something all right and so I started falling in love with things like that and knowing what made me excited about the romance and what kept me turning pages and a lot of it was the stuff that I thought I was too cool for back when I wrote that that first series um so I had to really just change my mindset on that and just learn to love these things and to amplify the things that I really love. If there's, if there's a certain trope, because there's certain things I probably am not going to write. I'm probably not going to write bully romance. I'm probably not going to write, you know, I understand the, the, like, like understanding the things, the, um, you know, the excitement behind those tropes that maybe I don't think I'm going to write is really helpful, but also just leaning into the ones that I love. And the other thing that really helped me, like one of my biggest aha moments was, um, reading the book. Oh, I wrote it down because I knew I was going to forget what is it called how to write a swoon worthy, sweet romance by Victory and Lisky. I read that book and it was like, like, a romance is not about two people who are in love and things are cool and things are great, which is what I thought it was in the first book. I'm like, I'm going to have people, they're not going to, this couple is not going to have conflict. They're going to be healthy, blah, 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 blah. And then I learned romance isn't about two healthy people just getting along. Wait, it's about conflict between the couple and how it's hard for them to be in a relationship. And I was like, what? I did not realize that. And then finally everything clicked. I'm like, all my favorite romances are not about two people just like, let's go grocery shopping. It's a great day. It's like, like, ah, I'm going to stab you with a knife and then you're going to lick your bottom lip and I'm going to be like, Ooh. So (laughs) it, um, it was like a really cool aha moment. So I was like, that is so true. And so I love that book for one. So anyone who is trying to learn more about the romance genre, that was really helpful. Also, I really love Gwen Hayes, um, romancing the beat. And I will say that I do write like pretty fantasy heavy books and they're pretty complicated plots. So I don't always follow all the rules, especially when it comes to how to like where to hit the beats. I know that I don't follow those rules, but knowing them is very helpful because then you know when you're breaking them and you're aware and then you can assess how your readers respond to those rules that you broke to see if you can break them again. I've actually had a lot of um, authors suggest reading Romance in the Beats and a lot of them swear by once they read that book and actually started applying the rules that it helped their career phenomenally, which is really interesting that you just reject them and don't follow that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. kidding. But um, yeah, and I guess too, like that one is specific on romance. Obviously having the element of fantasy is very different because as you said, it's very heavy. There's a lot of world building. So I imagine you would have to twist some of the rules because I mean, it's fantasy and we all have to twist rules a little bit in there. Yeah, especially like the, I'm definitely not the author who, I don't know why I love the setup. I love the setup in a book. I love just having this really complex opening couple chapters. Like I love reading the books where like the couple meets in chapter one, but for some reason I cannot write like that. It takes them forever, not really forever, but I feel like it's forever before they finally meet, Uh, especially when I compare it to where the beats are supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen in like chapter two or three or whatever. And I'm like, how about chapter seven? (laughs) But I, I do really love the setup and um so far I think it works I think my readers also love the setup because I spend a lot of time with the characters I've heard some people say that my you know the beginning dragged along I'm like I know I'm so sorry but I really love writing the beginnings I think too so 
<laughs> I'm going to defend both of us here because I do a similar thing and I have <laughs> concerns for the same thing because I know it gets a little bit into it. But also at the same time, I think it's important to create what, what their life is like now. And yeah. why the stakes have increased, what's changing. Because if you had that right at the start, you wouldn't understand where the character's originating from or what their mindset is before the peril begins. And then, of course, that's when they meet, you know, ex hottie over here. But <laughs> I, and I do the same thing, so I have concerns about it. But I wonder if you have this, is that when you're writing, though, it has a natural pace already. You can't push it even if you tried because it's yes. just how it has to roll out naturally or it just feels too forced and dare I say I think readers would picked up on that sort of forced writing as well would you agree with that no I totally agree because I've even I've assessed my books and like can I cut these chapters just have it start right here and I'm like no I don't think I would love the book as much and that is important that I feel like I love the book and that I feel like I love the characters and that I've established them in a way that I feel like is going to be meaningful going forward and I definitely respect the readers or the writers who can do that I definitely wouldn't say that that's like wrong to just throw them in at the the opening I get excited when I read books like that but as a writer I don't enjoy writing like that I just don't and I feel like it would show if I force myself to do that yeah I think too there's a reader expectation as well once you have you know um readers who absolutely love your work they kind of have that expectation and they know what they're going yeah. into if you threw them straight into the deep end straight away they'd be like did she miss the first four chapters like, <laughs> but is this a trick <laughs> what speaking of readers then what has been your most memorable reader interaction moment um oh my gosh there's so many a lot of them happen on Instagram of course because it's my favorite fan art and just seeing people write reviews like like I'll have my art team who will, who will write reviews and that is so awesome but when it's like a reader I'm like I don't even know you and you love my book um one of my favorite 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 interactions though is pretty recent um the Instagrammer her name is her handle is a girl a girl in red um red as in r-e-a-d cosplayed uh three of my books my trilogy series and they were amazing oh my gosh I looked at them and like almost cried. So I'm like, this is so cool. Like she cosplayed the first cover and then she cosplayed um, character art. And it was just amazing. I loved it so much. I was like showing my husband like, look, oh my gosh, this is so cool. That's so cool. I love, I love moments like that where you start to see your vision of what you had in your world come to fruition, but it's not only by you, but somebody else who you've had that connection with just because of what you've written. It's a very magical moment. So I'm so excited. I'm going to have to go. I'm assuming it's on your Instagram. I'm assuming you reshared it. I am going to go have a look because that sounds so good. Yeah, it's definitely in my tag photos for sure. And I, I, I do believe it's in my stories, but I'm not sure. I have like my highlights of, of all my favorite uh, pictures for each series or book that I have but yeah that one was for my Fair Isle trilogy series and she did all three books in that it was so cool you do a lot um in your you have a Facebook group as well don't you I do yeah what was the name of the Facebook group so the Facebook group what is Royal Readers and it's very small I'm only I'm so I'm not as great on Facebook as I am at Instagram but I'm starting to get better at it it's a pretty small group um but it did start when I wrote my first series so the, I think the I think the address is still Royal Readers of Layla because the land um that I wrote my first book in was called Layla but mm -hmm. I the name is just Royal Readers because it I didn't understand that I probably shouldn't base my entire like author brand around one book <laughs> but yeah it's called um royal readers and I like I said I'm not as active as I probably should be but I'm getting so much better I'm starting to realize that I'm not bothering people by sharing the art that I just finished and posting things and that's I think that's the thing where it's like Instagram feels a little more like oh I'm just posting this and whoever passes by can see it but I'm like in Facebook groups I'm like oh what if I'm just being annoying what if I'm bothering people I'm like what people join the group because they want to be bothered by my my updates so yeah I, I am getting a little more active in there <laughs> amazing I'm assuming your greatest obstacle has been coming over self-doubt I would love to know what your greatest accomplishment has been so far uh, my greatest accomplishment definitely was working or just being able to go full-time I 
in 2020, at the beginning of 2020, I wrote out my goals for my five-year plan. And most of them I reached by the end of that year, which like blew my mind and all the rest of them I surpassed last year. And so now I, I need a, I need a new five-year plan. Um, so that was like amazing to see the momentum because I could only, I also make goals that are very, that feel very close. I don't really make these enormous stretch goals. I make goals that feel really attainable in like a really happy way. Not like, oh, this is huge and I have to do it. It's kind of scary and I don't believe that I can really do it. And so you get in your head about it. So I will say I probably made goal, my goals a little bit too easy for five years, but also it was like, it was what I could see. It was what I knew for sure I could do in five years. Um, and then I did it in like a year, year and a half. And by this, me, it's hard for you to even say I did it because I don't feel like I specifically went out and was like, okay, this is what's going to happen to make this happen. I just feel very blessed that it happened. Um, yeah, I, I hate just to use the word luck, but I'm like, sometimes I feel like I just got lucky. <laughs> But, and it's hard work too. It's like aligning all those things. And I think it's always important to have a clear direction and understanding as to where you want your career to go. And I think, as you're saying before, you journalize. I think that's huge. Like I do the same thing and I know everyone's different, but even having a sort of inclination or writing down what your goals are is amazing because then if you don't know where you're going and what direction, sure, you can say, I'm going to be a millionaire author but how are you going to get there? And then it becomes very intimidating. And then that's yes. when that gets in. So I think writing down attainable goals is amazing. And congratulations on achieving that in a year and a half. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so then you're going to hate this question. This is my, personally, this is my favorite question to ask, but what is the big dream then? What is the biggest goal that you want for your career? Oh, that is so hard because like I said, I need to reassess my five-year plan. And I know that I can, I can stretch my mind now to much bigger things. Um, my next goal, I, I like, I don't know if I have my biggest goal yet, because I think that I haven't quite understood what the cap is. I don't think I see that yet, um, in my mind, but my next big goal, which is actually pretty small is I really want one of my books, at least one of my books to be picked up by a major book box for an exclusive edition with a fancy, like, cover and sprayed edges like that's like a really big thing to me I see a couple other indie authors getting that and I'm like oh, me next me next please me next this is what I want next so uh sorry I didn't quite answer that question the way I should but that's my next like big goal I guess me yeah next goal. <laughs> I, I love that goal too because I like uh, that's an amazing to see that because I like Elise Cope at KCL Bond yes. like, within the last six months and they are just so beautiful and I'm like please please so <laughs> yes get it let's um let's make this happen this year we've got this yeah <laughs> so I have a segment called speed dating with an author so I lit a candle I created ambience uh we're going to go to a very romantic date but what it basically is is five rapid questions are you ready yes I'm ready All right what is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Uh, the clumsiest moment, I have so many, but probably the worst one was when I was in my early 20s. I fell down the stairs and twisted my ankle the very same week that I bleached my eardrum when I was bleaching my hair. So you bleached your <laughs> it was eardrum. not a great time. Yeah, I was okay. So I was not the most responsible 20 something year old and I bleached my own hair and I do remember having bleach getting into my ear. I mean, like, that's probably not awesome. And then I woke up and I couldn't hear. Um, but yeah, then I was also limping. So I couldn't hear for about a month out of that year. And I was limping and had a very, very swollen ankle. Um, and I was also going on tour with one of my bands around the same time. But my ankle he healed up. And my ear cleared up right around the same time on one of our first shows. So I think that it was okay. Oh my goodness. You're so lucky that didn't go permanent. I know. I can't believe how everything just seems so like, oh, it's fine. When I, when I was in my early twenties, like I don't have to go to the hospital for that. I've got fluid coming out of my ear. I'm sure it's going to heal. It's going to be awesome. Now it would be like, oh, let's get to the emergency room. <laughs> Like it. Well, we learn from our, mis our lesson, should I say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, what, is, what is your life motto? Okay, this is the worst motto ever, and I'm recovering from it, but I've always said this. I would rather do it wrong now than wait and do it right later. It's 
not a very smart motto and I'm learning to be a lot more intentional and to slow down. Um, but I can be a very impatient person and I can just be like, I just want to like do it right now instead of, you know, waiting and learning a little bit more information. Like, let's just do it. See what happens. You learn from your yeah. mistakes, right? <laughs> I don't think it's a worse motto, but I think you definitely put a more positive spin on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what are the three words that best describe you? Um, so I have been called whimsical, also weird, but I'll go whimsical because that's a little more flattering. Um, also persevering. I do persevere in the face of challenge a lot. Um, another one would be, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I don't even know. Um, creative. Yeah, I think that's a good one. <laughs> what is a song that would best describe you? Ooh, Cosmic Dancer by T-Rex. Uh, I am literally always moving around. You've probably seen me on this video <laughs> waving my hands around. I don't sit still very well. And a lot of times if I'm just like doing idle time, I just like move around a little bit. And I'm not talking about like hot girl dancing. Like if I was, if I'm like at a party with my friends, I don't party with my friends anymore. I stay home and I read books and drink kombucha and maybe watch movies. Um, but you know, back in the day when I would be hang partying with my friends, everyone's doing like these hot girl dances and I'm just like being super weird in a corner somewhere. Um, but that's literally me all the time. I dance with my pets. Um, it just feels like a good way to like disperse my energy. I don't know. I'm whimsical. It's going to say weird, but let's go with whimsical. And full circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? Okay, this one surprises people. But I am really good at identifying dogs, dog breeds on site. Um, not a lot of people know that I was absolutely obsessed with dogs when I was younger. And my very first book that I ever bought with my own money was a dog dictionary or dog encyclopedia, whichever one it would be encyclopedia. So I could look at different dog breeds and identify them because I wasn't allowed to have a dog. So I was like, well, I'm just going to know everything there's to know about dogs. I'm going to understand what the, you know, the different types of ears that they have, their fur patterns. Um, I'm not as great at it as I used to be, but still like, like, oh yes, that's a, that kind of dog. And is your dog a mix between this and this? You're like, it is I'm like, <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> what then what's your favorite breed oh that's so hard because I do have a dog who's a Jindo and he's the best dog ever so I have to say Jindo is my favorite um but oh there's so many I love golden retrievers I love French bulldogs I love Shiba Inus and uh, I, I can't I'm just gonna go on for too long I love dogs so much I also have cats but um I never had a cat encyclopedia I just love to pet them but the breeds and the, you know, all the weird information about dogs, uh, that's a little more my forte. <laughs> I have had so much fun today, Sasanya. So where do we find your books? Where do we find you? Um, and what's coming up? Um, so I, my website is Tasanya. Oh, I had to think for a second. TasanyaOdette.com. Sorry, a lot of my stuff is under just my first name because it's not a very common name. So a lot of times I pick Tasanya for things, but no, my website is TasanyaOdette.com. Um, so there's a lot of information there, a lot of links to my books. All my eBooks are uh, exclusive with Amazon, um, but I also have paperbacks and hardcovers, which are pretty much everywhere. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Tasanya and all the other social medias that I don't use very much usually at Tasanya. <laughs> um, next up, I am actually rewriting and re-releasing that first series I've talked about was so terrible. Um, and I can't say it was terrible. I've learned a lot and there are people who are reading it, but now that I've learned so much, it's been really hard for me to let that series go, especially when I analyze things like read through and I can tell people are trying, they're reading that first book and they're not, not Re moving on to the second book that often but the people who are reading the second book are reading the third one and I know there's a disconnect and I've been wanting to change the covers just because I know that I could hit the market better on the covers but every time I think about that I'm like I could hit the market on the book <laughs> and so I'm finally decided to just go for I'm rewriting the 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 whole book, at least the first book. I'm not sure. I'm in the process of that. And it is, I thought it was going to be a heavy edit. It is a full rewrite. I've hardly kept a single word intact. So much has changed on this, on this book. The plot's still the same, but character motivations, there's so much that's changing, but I'm loving it. I'm really, really enjoying the process. And I feel like it is going to be more up to par with my other books that I now have um, now feel like me. Like those are the books that feel like me and what I write. Um, so we'll see how book two and three goes. Hopefully it is not as 
<laughs> intricate of a process as this one is proving to be. Um, but yeah, that's what's coming up next for me. And then I have a couple more releases later in the year that I'm super excited about too. Amazing. I am so excited to see what 2022 brings you because I just know it's going to bring you a lot of good things and I'm so excited to be a part of your journey. So thank you so much for coming on and who knows, maybe we'll get you on next year. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to love you and leave you for now, but we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye, guys.